Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Pianci. I'm joined as usual by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. How are you, Cass? Doing good. We are going to be talking about, uh, I, I feel like this is just a topic that never goes away as much as I want it to. Our boy Justin Sun and his stablecoin, True USD. Um, I guess I shouldn't be saying his stablecoin, but that's what we all know it as at this point. Um, but yeah, we're going to get into all the weird shit that's been going on with it. It's been just a strange, even we were talking about it last time uh, with the Data Finnovation boys. There's been some weird updates, the lawsuit, etc. cetera. Um, so, so let's start. Let's start there. Let's start with the lawsuit. Sure. Uh, so just for some context, last time we talked about this with Jonathan Ryder and Patrick Tan, the world, or at least the knowledgeable connected world, assumed True USD was connected to Justin Sun. We knew Justin Sun was a partner market maker, but we assumed that since December 2020, when Tech Carex bought the brand name, that Justin Sun has owned it, but that was not publicly known. In the interim, since we did that last episode, a couple of things have been revealed. One of those things, as you mentioned, is that former Trust Token CEO Daniel Jiayong An is suing Archblock formerly Trust Token, and in the course of that lawsuit includes some conversations, negotiations, and information about uh, a period in 2020 when the Tron Foundation was trying to purchase TrueUSD in a, in a deal that was being negotiated by Can Sun, a lawyer, and Justin Sun in the Tron Foundation to purchase TrueUSD. So that came out. Um, the other piece of information just before we really get into this conversation is uh, Adam Cochran, a uh, venture capitalist, did some digging into True USD and identified a bunch of other links that show up. Like uh, it seems Jennifer Zhang may also be on some of the BitTorrent related companies and stuff like that and has all these other pre existing connections to Justin Sun which really kind of undercuts their December 2020 statement that Justin Sun has no involvement at all. So those were like the two pieces of information that have come out that have taken it from Justin Sun. So I just want us to hit the I want us to hit the brakes here for a second. Okay. I just want us to hit the brakes, throw the car into reverse because I think we've we've kind of um jumped into a lot here. I know we've talked about true USD. We've talked about these stable coins before. Um and I know that a stable coin as far as complexity goes, it can be they can be very complex and they can be not complex. True USD at what its base value is, but what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be one of these simpler stable coins. So that isn't what I want to get into us reversing and discussing. I do want us to talk about TrueFi. I want us to talk about Arc Arc Block. I want us to talk about these entities that have been and Tectariex, um, I, I want us to talk about these entities that have been popping up, doing one or two things, disappearing, rebranding, renaming. These are the corporate shenanigans that we're used to because we've been dealing with this with Tether and these other entities forever. But l- let's talk about it. So TrueFi, what 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 was True? What what was True? What was TrueFi? Or what is TrueFi? What was the trust token ecosystem? What was this lending f- pro- program, et cetera? Yeah, so this is a little complicated, but a US-based company called Trust Labs was started back in like 2017 to start doing tokenized assets, focusing most of their effort on stable coins. So they had a couple of other efforts. They eventually launched a variety of stable coins, True USD, AUD, GUP, GBP, so British Pound, Hong Kong Dollar, and probably Euro, if I didn't say that already. Then they started launching some other things. They did a fundraise with their True Token, where Alameda Research was a lead investor, and the True Token was meant to govern the TrueFi lending platform, which was a lending platform designed for uncollateralized loans of primarily stable coins to people extended through this platform. Alameda Research, who again, as we mentioned, was one of the lead investors in the True Token, was extended millions of dollars of uncollateralized loans through this platform from an entity called Trust Trading, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Archblock, which is what Trust Token rebranded to after they sold off TrueUSD and all that. Besides that, there's um, 
Yeah, and so that's ArchBlock, that's TrueFi. Alameda Research, as we mentioned, was a lead investor in True Token, was getting loans from TrueFi. According to Chain Argos, Research was like the largest minter and redeemer of TrueUSD, um, followed by, I think, Justin Sun was in second place. Uh, and so, yeah, that was broadly like the set of entities we're looking at here. We should also right. probably mention Tecterix, right? Tecterix, which is nominally an Asian, Asia-based conglomerate that seems like it's actually incorporated out of the British Virgin Islands, where they, uh, which was used to purchase initially just kind of the name True USD, and ArchBlock was still in charge of a lot of the administration. A few months ago, Protos reported that the private keys and the rest of the stuff that ArchBlock had been managing had been transferred over to Tecterix, and shortly after we published that, uh, TrueUSD came out and announced their international transition. And so now TrueUSD is kind of more fully separate from ArchBlock, which used to be Trust Token, and seems to be basically wholly and fully controlled by Justin Sun. Yeah, that's right. We, we don't have any, like, I, I don't think there's any way to fully prove it at this point. So, you know, we'll, I, allegedly, there's the word. Um, allegedly, uh, Tectariex and True USD and the rest of this stuff is now completely controlled by Justin Sun. Allegedly. Um, but there's also been some weird shenanigans with that. I mean, uh, in terms of its collateral, in terms of where its collateral is. I think we, we got into it with the boys last time, so we don't necessarily need to get into the, the, the depths of that. So, but, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but you bring that up, and I didn't think we had to get into it, but there was a little bit of a note in Daniel's lawsuit that makes me think we need to bring it up, because one of the things we talked about is how the collateral being held at Flow Bank is no longer appropriately being held in escrow and instead being held directly by agents of Tecterix or whatever. What was mentioned in Daniel's lawsuit is that Tecterix is currently trying to, or Trust Token Archblock, there's currently an attempted restructuring of some of these entities that'll put them in Switzerland. And Daniel is opposed to that restructuring, believing it unfairly deprives him of wealth that is supposed to be his. But so that was kind of the interesting wrinkle to me is that we saw all this money moved to Switzerland in this account that was not appropriately escrowed. And then we hear that there's an attempted restructuring going on in that same jurisdiction. I, I want to point out that this uh, lawsuit was filed pro se. Um, <laughs> and it reads like it too. Is, <laughs> and it reads like it, which is it's an important point because uh, for anyone who's not aware, that means that there's no lawyer involved in this, that this guy is, is doing this lawsuit on his own without the help of a lawyer. And uh, yeah, that it doesn't stand much of a chance is basically what that means. Um, because generally, whether you're defending yourself uh, in a court of law or you are suing someone else in a court of law, if you're doing it on your own with the help without the help of legal assistance, you're probably not going to get very far. Um, and so, yeah, we, we can presume as much also because this guy claims that he's owed $96 million um, and you would be able to get a lawyer to agree to terms if that if they actually thought you had a chance of seeing that $96 million. It doesn't sound like any lawyer thought he had a chance of seeing that $96 million. And, so, and, and we should also I just add wanted to add that is, caveat to, yeah, the, to the lawsuit. And, and this is kind of a countersuit because... Archblock, formerly Trust Token, has had a separate lawsuit against him for deleting their internal Slack when he was voted out of the CEO position. Um, and that's been ongoing for over like two years now. Yes. Um, that is a, a, a lengthy, uh, I guess he's been pushing for a lot of discovery information and, and vice versa. And uh, yeah, it's been a slow process, a slow legal wrangling. Yeah. yeah. The, the, a the lot of weird claims and... and yeah, so I, I think the most important claims we should take out of it are not some of the ones about behavior of certain executives that were given without evidence. The part that seems more plausible to me are the parts where we can see some of the messages regarding these negotiations and some of the names mentioned. I th That has a lot more credence to it than some of the other allegations contained in it. It doesn't, it doesn't to me. So there, there, uh, I believe Bennett is one of the things he's speaking about, for instance, is that there is a um, text message exchange with Justin Sun 
it's hard to call it even an exchange because it's almost all one sided. Um, Daniel t- uh, sending messages to Justin's son, which leads me to believe he was sending these messages knowing full well that he was going to be screenshotting this conversation because he was like, OK, I'm going to look good right here. Um, whereas he doesn't show us the entirety of this conversation when it started, what was said, uh, what the hopes and and aspirations were for this for this takeover um all he shows is him saying to justin that he thinks it's a bad idea yeah grain of salt there there is uh, one other thing i want to highlight though is he does include the name of a lawyer who is supposedly helping justin's son negotiate this and points specifically to a lawyer named can son uh which we don't know if there's any relation to Justin there. It's a relatively common name, so we don't want to jump to too many assumptions. But this lawyer is interesting because they worked for Fenwick and West, which is a firm that represented the BitTorrent Foundation in 2018 or 2019 when the Trown Foundation was acquiring it. And then Kansun left Fenwick and West where they were working with Daniel Friedberg to go be a general counsel at FTX underneath Daniel Friedberg. Um, and so that name was an interesting Not the connector. best career decision, can we just say. Well, <laughs> and I think it is telling in the context of some of the other Alameda Research connections I alluded to before, right? Mm-hmm. Alameda Research was the largest or was a lead True Token investor, was getting like the largest loans out of anyone on the True Five. Pro- platform was the largest issuer and redeemer of true usd like that is important context when we're considering the this lawyer's trajectory sure sure I, that we've gone into their escapades before we urge people i i, I urge uh, anyone to listen to our episode with jason brawl uh we talk about the some of the lawyers that are now getting mentioned a lot Um, And we were talking about it years before all of this nonsense. Uh, These guys have been involved in crypto for a while. I think, I mean, for, I remember when you and I were first getting into cryptocurrency, so many people, so many of the people who were putting a lot of money into it were poker folks. Like it was pretty commonplace. I, I don't know if there's that same association these days, but it certainly was a big, a big deal before. I know now that, uh, with Rollbit uh, getting such a a big platform from a bunch of individuals on cryptocurrency Twitter that perhaps we're seeing this kind of poker gaming, uh, illegal gambling th- stuff getting popular again, and we'll see where that goes. But um, for what? a while there, it seemed like there was at least a, a break. Yeah, so I I think there's a couple of dynamics there, and I think there's a reason it's coming back, too. You'll remember when we had Jason on to talk about, he talked about, like, pre-Black Friday, in the lead-up where there was starting to be more and more pressure on some of these poker sites. It became harder and harder to deposit and withdraw money from these sites. And so the poker players who were still using them got comfortable using more and more unconventional methods of moving money in order to continue right. having this opportunity. Right. He mentioned jewelry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he like, mentioned like, jewelry like, being a very common thing. Which is like the same way that uh, Backpage was doing it for a while for some of their stuff. Um, and so what's interesting to me is that I think this allowed them to be well positioned to take advantage of crypto early on because they were familiar with many of these unconventional mm. rails that crypto companies began to rely on. As Mm. crypto companies began to get banked at Signature and Silvergate and everywhere else, some of that barrier to entry decreased and it became easier for some of these people to use it. I think as we've seen the debanking of crypto, it will become like the proportion of people like that, poker players and stuff like that, will again kind of shift more towards overrepresentation as some of the barriers mm. to trading crypto go up. Okay, yeah, that's an interesting, uh, interesting perspective I hadn't been thinking about. Uh, we obviously had the continue the continuous line of these lawyers, the legal the legal p- representation for for major cryptocurrency exchanges and um, yeah. and other entities have has for some reason, always skewed toward the same legal representation of the worst outfits in the poker world back in the day. So I don't know what that means. I'm just saying that they were hiring the 
legal representation for the worst companies in poker back in the day, uh, whatever whatever that means. Um, but anyway, so there's some other stuff, though, in regard to Justin's son uh, outside of just this lawsuit. Um, one of the big things that's been that has been getting a lot of attention, actually, I, not just you and, uh, you know, and uh, the data innovation boys, uh, but but other people, too, have been focused on this wrapped Bitcoin, um, which seems to have vanished into thin air, which is like pretty sure something Bitcoin can't can't do, right? Like it can't just vanish off the blockchain. How does that happen? There was a boating accident. Um, yeah, so mm, what we're talking about- On the blockchain. About, there are a couple versions of wrapped Bitcoin on Tron. There's one very small one that's done by like the same people who did wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum. Custody is done by BitGo. And it's very easy to find the addresses for that one, but no one uses it. The one everyone uses is a product that was initially offered by Poloniex. Poloniex, as we've mentioned on here before, seems to have been acquired by Justin Sun. We'll say seems to be, since he wants to pretend he didn't do it. That one, you no one can find the backing for. I've gone looking. I have not been able to find the backing. Uh, Protos asked Poloniex where the backing is, and they said, you're not a customer. We can't tell you that. Um, and no one else seems to be able to find it. And that is not great because, well, it's thousands and thousands of Bitcoin, including a significant portion of the Bitcoin reserves at Huobi. Like customer reserves that are supposed to be allocated for customers are not in regular Bitcoin like you would expect. They're in this wrapped Bitcoin that is from Poloniex, where no one can find where the tokens are custodied. Besides Wobi, you see a bunch of them go to SunSwap, to JustLend. <laughs> Those protocols, I know this sorry, is- Sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. So for anyone who's, yeah, we'll pause again here. <laughs> Justin Sun is so self-obsessed that everything he creates has to, in some way, like have his name associated with it. Um, obviously, JustLend is, as in Justin Sun, Justin Sun Lend, Just Lend, and then there's a what was it? Sun Sun what Swap. I, <laughs> sun is, Swap. Yeah. So you can yeah, swap you at Sun's little decks, and so yeah, there are thousands of Bitcoin that are supposedly on the Tron network, where no one can find the corresponding Bitcoins on the Bitcoin network. The entity that's supposed to be custodying them and managing these swaps won't tell anyone where they're stored. This and that same entity, sorry, that same entity promised back in November that they would release a proof of reserves shortly. They have yet to release any kind yeah. of like Merkle proof of reserves. Uh, okay. And when Protoss this... asked them about it, they said they're still working on it. We asked them why eight months wasn't enough time to finish it, and they just said we're still working on it. This brings around a, a larger point that I'm sure we've touched on before, but this this is something I, I, I've noticed a lot more lately, which is that I, when, when were these wrapped Bitcoin originally cre like, created like 2018 okay this speaks to so i think one of the ongoing Sorry, measures that people, 2020 2020 okay nonetheless three years so this speaks to me to me this speaks to there, there's this consistent narrative that the blockchain and cryptocurrency provides transparency because you can you can go on these uh scanning you can use scanning tools, you can use breadcrumbs, you can use you can use all of these things to try to get get information that you wouldn't be able to otherwise, for instance, from the Federal Reserve or, or whatever they want to say. <clears throat> Unfortunately, what you just what you just proved is that this dude did this thing in 2018. No one knows where these coins are now. 2020. However yeah. long they've been gone, if they ever were wrapped in the first place, like no one knows. No one knows. And that it's there is no the, the trans what transparency? This is obfuscation. This is this is creating extra steps that people just don't fucking care about. Nobody's gonna bother checking to ensure that the rap Bitcoin like nobody fucking cared. Nobody cared in 2020. Like hardly anyone cares, right? Like now people care because they're like, dude, are there just millions of dollars just upped and walked away? What what happened, right? But like if Protos hadn't done this and people hadn't been asking some questions eventually, who knows, right? 
And I, and that I, I just, it just bugs me because there's this narrative of it being so transparent. And the reality is, where's the transparency? This is obfuscation. It's an extra layer to trying to, even if you say like, we proved it, there's no Bitcoin here. They just go, oh, well, we're auditing it and figuring it out. We'll get back to you. Like, what does that even mean? Where are they? Just give me an address, put them in an address, give me the address. Then we can all say, hey, that address has them. And if someone moves them, we can go, why the fuck are you moving the ones that are supposed to be in that address? But they don't want to do that. And I think, yeah, yeah. I think kind of what we're getting at here, like through, like the reason this to me is connected to true USD beyond just the fact that it's Justin, is it points towards kind of this pattern of what you're talking about, claiming transparency, claiming this openness, while doing everything possible to try to obscure the true intention. With true USD, that's obscuring the nature of the ownership, where the collateral is stored, how it's stored, and what that means. Even the nature of, like, we talked about this when the Chain Argos guys were on, it seemed like attestations for true USD restarted once they started manually sharing the information for this right. non escrow bank account with the network firm. And so that isn't particularly transparency. That's not using the blockchain for your best effect. Same with this WBTC. There are millions of dollars of value being placed in these protocols and being treated as if it is fully collateralized by Bitcoin with no other claim against it without the evidence that's true. And like this is a pattern throughout all of Justin's things and we've talked about on some of his Tron projects, but just sticking close to him for now, like uh, he, there's this other new project they launched recently called Staked USDT. And Staked USDT is supposedly controlled by a new entity called the RWA DAO, for Real World Assets DAO. And the idea is they're going to take all these stable coins and they're going to invest them in something in the real world and pay the yield back to token holders. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to actually be a DAO. There was no they claim they did this in collaboration with Just Lend DAO, but there's no proposal on Just Lend DAO related to this, no discussion of this in the Just Lend DAO governance forums. And 85% of this staked USDT goes to Huobi, which again is almost certainly Justin Sun owned, but we have to say Justin Sun advised because Justin Sun, Justin Sun f still feels the need to lie about this. 85% right, of the total supply of this new Tron token that's being invested in something with no disclosure goes to this exchange and is included in the Nansen dashboard that Huobi published to try to prove they have all the assets they claim. So, and and this, yeah, this gets me back into, so Huobi, the, like, I just want to, I want to point out to everyone, and I know I, some people are aware of um, how I have my my own personal animosity towards Justin Sun, um, that he is my Moby Dick, uh, my my white whale, if you will. Right? Watch, our, um, watch our episode with uh, Josh Cincinnati and Lawrence for that one. Right. Um, and, and many other episodes sure. as well. When you look at, at everything combined for this, for this gentleman, um, he's not allowed in mainland China anymore. I want to make this clear. Under, under his passport that is his Chinese passport. He is no longer allowed in the country. Uh, he, when he does go, uh, you can almost guarantee that he is using a St. Kitts and Nevis passport or his Granada passport or his Malta passport or his whatever passport, his Central African Republic passport, whichever one he wants to pop out and use. Um, he's using one of those instead. Why? Well, obviously because the, the CCP wouldn't want him coming back um why well you got to ask them i don't know i don't know why they what would happen if he did return under his passport but he isn't Zaudon. um and right yes go ahead and watch our episode about Zhao dong and ren ren bit um but there there's also the issue of him establishing all these companies in hong kong not under his uh again not under his chinese name He's only doing it with his St. Kitts and Nevis passport. He's using other individuals to, um, including apparently his parents possibly, as like individuals who are owning these companies or representing these companies like Tectariex. Like the things he's doing to jump through hoops to try to get through 
the legal system in ways that he must think are effective. Um, it just screams red flags on everything he touches. So whether it's Poloniex, Wobi, USDD, which is just the stupidest fucking stable coin in history, or uh, there's the other one. What was it? JUSD or USDJ, whatever the hell it is. The that one is USDJ. perpetually above. Right. USDJ perpetually above a dollar. I think it's probably trading for a dollar 12 right now or something like that. It doesn't it doesn't matter. Um, None of this matters. True USD, true USD now. It, all of it. And th this is this has been my one of my issues for a long time is that for for probably two, three, four years now, people have been saying Justin is rich. Justin is so rich. This was then this is so similar to the SBF narrative to me, because when they go, he's so rich, I go, OK, where, though? With what? With what assets? What real world assets does this guy have that suggest he actually has money? And when you look at the shit he's doing with his cryptocurrencies, the stuff he's hiding, the stuff he's stealing, the lawsuits he's involved in, like the the Wobi people are suing him because he has continued to use the Wobi name when he said he wasn't going to, like all of these things combined to show an individual I wouldn't I wouldn't trust for any amount of money any amount of money. I wouldn't hand this guy a nickel. I don't know what this guy would do with it. Like this guy screams bad news and you just you're just naming more things to me where I'm like, uh-huh, and this is to be expected. Okay. He says he wrapped the Bitcoin, but he didn't do it. Then he sent all his money to Wobi and then he then he stole customer funds and then he did sure. None of this is surprising to me. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what we're getting at here is these events exist in a pattern of behavior for Justin Sun. And the reason I think it's important to highlight these specific ones is the same reason we wanted to have Jonathan and Patrick of Chain Argos on is because this kind of offshore financial system involving many of these actors, Alameda Research, FTX, Justin Sun, True USD, and of course, our friends at the world's most transparent stablecoin, Tether, has its uses from like light gray, but never fully white, to like fully dark black, black market stuff. And many of the behaviors in maneuvering seem like someone who has fewer dollars than they're supposed to for all the people they owe and think if they can keep things moving for long enough, that fact won't come out. And sometimes these entities end up in that position because bank accounts get seized, bank accounts get frozen, money they thought they had ends up not being money they have, and that could be part of this, right? Like True USD presumably lost some money at Prime Trust, though apparently it's only 20K. Um, and so, yeah, you have kind of this pattern where sometimes these entities seem really wealthy because they're behaving really wealthy, but they're behaving really wealthy to continue the fiction that they have all that money because they need to have all that money or they're in much deeper shit. One of the important parts that I think everyone has already kind of forgotten about the FTX and Alameda fiasco was that he was marking illiquid assets as though he could sell them on the open market for the value they were trading at on FTX or whatever that day. Like, insanity. You're going to be taking massive haircuts if you try to sell these positions. And we don't know what the other investments are for things like true USD, right? We don't know what these other investments are. We don't know what these things are that are actually backing this thing at this point, other than they're being marked to some imaginary value that says that they're fully backed and we don't know what it's backed with. And this is well, like, this is part of the issue, right? Yeah. Yeah. And like even specifically in true USD, we already talked about how some of the things aren't appropriately held in escrow, but they won't make any kind of representations about the quality of securities being held at First Digital in Hong Kong, where they're holding a significant portion of their assets. And First Digital themselves just launched their own stablecoin, which immediately got listed on Binance. Like immediately like two days after it launched was already listed they Binance. said so they so, so to be fair and just so everyone is aware they they started the the stable coin in in partnership with binance and 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 like Wobi and these and like these and and justin sun and cz like they they they, they were working together with them for sure from the very get-go and like uh, like there's no that's not that isn't surprising to me 
But I do want people to realize that First Digital is a trust based out of Hong Kong. Do, do we really think that they're moving billions of U.S. dollars into and out of Hong Kong through this through this uh, through this trust? It, well, Maybe. It, it, I doubt it. It's like we talked about with Jonathan and Patrick. If they are, it's in a more convoluted transaction, right? Involving right. other counterparties or entities or structures between the U.S. dollars and the assets that end up at first digital backing true USD. And that's been kind of the point of complexity at the heart of these stablecoins since we started covering Tether in 2017. The mechanics they claim don't match up with their behavior. Like the mechanics of them collecting a U.S. dollar from someone, storing it in a bank account, and only then issuing the asset, and then wiring that dollar back out only when it's redeemed, does not match up with the behavior of really any of the stablecoins. USDC and Paxos, whatever, fine. The U.S.-based ones we're not going to worry about. But like that has been true since the beginning. We have heard for years with varying degrees of accuracy that Tether's transactions actually involved a much more convoluted set of counterparties that was meant to kind of aid in capital flight, transform Renminbi into uh, Tethers Uh, so that it can be used there, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to remember when we're talking about Justin Sun and all this that one of the principal use cases for many of these fake dollars is capital flight, right? Is money trying to get out of China? Yeah. I mean, it's been a point uh, that Protos has been particularly keen to make about about FTX, about about these entities, um, and about some other some other stuff lately. Like, I, I do think, you know, you don't have to be... I, like, whether you agree, whether you think Chinese capital flight is a good or bad thing, it doesn't really matter. It just is a thing that's happening. And clearly you know, someone's mad about it, right? You're breaking those rules and you're you're not obeying the laws and someone's going to be pissed. Either it's going to be the US or it's going to be China or it's going to be both. Well, and, um, and it has been China. China's busted a couple of them, Tether, what they call money laundering rings, which always sits somewhere between like money laundering, gambling proceeds and capital flight are all kind of described by the Chinese state apparatus as like broadly the same type of thing, but they've busted a couple of tether-based rings in the last couple months. Um, so they don't seem happy about that. No. I mean, the, the the Chinese government has made it very clear how they handle this stuff, and that is sh- a basically shoot first, ask questions later. Um, they, they're not... Zhao Dong was sitting in a jail cell for a year before he had a, a trial, and the trial lasted for like three days, and he was guilty, right? Like... These this they they don't operate the way we do here. And I'm not suggesting that's a good thing. I'm suggesting that's a real thing and that that is what you have to consider if you're going to be doing business in these places or with people in these places. And I think like Justin Sun is a prime example of the way, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, illicit. I don't know how you want to term it. Just funds that are, are like questionable questionable in their sourcing, questionable in how they were acquired, questionable in in what they're destined to do. Funds the, the banking way those system funds are, is reticent to accept. <laughs> which is crazy because the banking system is will happily accept most money. Um, HSBC so you gotta be really will build doing you a window f- to shove your cash through if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly right. So if you can't get HSBC on board, what the hell are you doing? Um yeah, I don't know. A million questions about Justin Sun still. So I'm glad we're bringing him up again, even though I hate talking about it. And uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens with True. Is there anything else that you wanted to touch on with these with these platforms, these Justin Sun related platforms and and vehicles? Well, I just want people to know that I know the uh, Cascoin Exchange proof of reserves has been delayed for eight months, but we're still hard at work on it. We expect to have it out any day now, and we guarantee it'll show you that we have assets. Yeah, we are using a top 100 auditor, um, so I don't know why anyone could claim otherwise. Uh, and I I look forward, honestly, I'm looking forward to us getting the uh, the audit done because I'm tired of people fudding my cast coin bags. Um Remember, guys, that, uh, yes, we are under investigation by the DOJ and the SEC and the CFTC, but under investigation means that they haven't charged you with anything yet. 